Hi guys, I'm Mike and welcome back to Indie Fanatics and to another driver interview. That's kind of two in uh, two weeks for you as we had Simon Pagano on just before he went on to winning Daytona. And uh, well, I think this is the perfect place to start as our guest, Carl Kirkwood, was also competing in the Rolex 24. And uh, you guys got fourth uh, in the GT Daytona cast, didn't you, with um, uh, Bassett Sullivan Racing. Go on, sorry completely forgot blank name there at the moment but yeah how was it Cole? <laughs> it was really good yeah we were i was driving for vassar sullivan and the lexus rcf gt3 uh it was obviously the first event that they were running gtd pro and it was myself ben barnico and jack hawksworth we all come from a similar background in, in motorsports coming up through karting through open wheel rank and then made our way into sports cars um, both Jack and Ben are a bit older than me. J- Jack's been on the Lexus program since I think 2017, since kind of their inception with the, with the new RCF GT3. So, um, it's really nice being able to go and learn a lot from him in the sports card side. And, um, like, like I said, we all have really similar backgrounds. So our mentality, what we kind of want from the car and everything works really well. Um, so it's, it, it makes it easy for Ben and I, because Jack goes out, sets up the car, does everything he wants. And then we go and drive it and we're like, yeah, this is pretty much perfect. Uh, this is exactly how we'd want it too. So, um, and that's crucial, right? When, when you go into a 24 hour event, you got to make sure the car's right because that's the car you're dealt with for the entire 24 hours. Cause you can't really change much with it. You're stuck with, um, the only thing you really change is tire pressures and wing angles. So making sure the balance is right with corner weights and spring rates, all that kind of stuff is super important. So um, it's nice having a group of drivers like like Ben and Jack to do everything and and make sure that the car is set up properly going into the big race. Ah, sounds awesome in terms of and so Jack's kind of like there. Come on, guys, you're allowed to put in some input. You're like, no, Jack, you've nailed it. I'm just I'm just happy to drive the car. We're, let, yeah, we're good exactly. To go. <laughs> that, that's exactly how it works. Yeah, he does a really good job with it. I must, um, obviously the previous year you, uh, w- were lined up to it and you guys, uh, DNF'd, um, in the 2020 season. So I bet it felt good that you guys could actually get out there, complete the full race and show what you were capable of on track and force pretty good. Yeah, uh, no, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. So in 2021, we, we retired kind of in the middle of the race. We led a bunch of it. We were kind of running in the top five range in, in GTD and um yeah we were we were struggling with a couple mechanicals but we learned what those were and we came back and executed perfectly we weren't that quick at the end of the race to be honest but um for the first 12 hours if it was a 12 hour race we probably would have won um but after 24 hours we were a bit fatigued and we had some damages from from driving through some people and um but for the most part we're super happy with performance i mean finishing fourth in such a deep field like that against so, so many major manufacturers was super important nice uh we seem to have lost you for a moment on camera yeah, for Not some sure. reason i just <laughs> i was getting it. i was getting another call there sorry no don't worry about it at all but no that sounds uh good and obviously uh, sports car racing has been quite a big part of well it's the first kind of senior level motorsport that you've probably competed in uh, as well as alongside your junior career. And how did that partnership come along with uh, Vassar Sullivan? And uh, you really get on well with those guys there, don't you? Yeah. So uh, the way it kind of came about was, I mean, it was, it's not really, it wasn't really meant to be at first because originally I was going to do Indy Lights in 2020 until, until the pandemic hit. Right. So, and then our championship got canceled um, for that season or it went on a hiatus and um, I was trying to figure out something else to do for the year and, um, it resulted in me doing some LMP three stuff. And then later on in the year, I got into their GTD car for both, uh, Petit Le Mans at road Atlanta and then at Sebring for the 12 hour. And, uh, I mean, we hit it off. The team really likes me. We all, there's a lot of people that are from the IndyCar side that are, that have joined that program. So there's a lot of familiar faces and, uh, it's kind of developed into a nice relationship. That's awesome. And uh, I, I bet it was, yeah, there, there weren't many positives to come from the pandemic, but I bet that was kind of a good one for you. And also the fact that it gives you uh, such an opportunity, because I always think guys from the IndyCar range, you get that opportunity to sports, drive sports cars, and obviously with the GTD cars with them. Um, but hopefully it then progresses onto maybe LMP2 and LMP1 entries in the future. 
or you know on the prototype side of things uh it, it must be pretty exciting um to have that almost step into that category as well alongside indycar yeah no it's really good because most guys that that get into sports cars it's usually after their indycar career right mm. um there's a lot of manufacturers that are involved that don't really know any of the drivers and i've kind of already started that that initial process pretty early um being linked up with with a major manufacturer like toyota and lexus um which is super i think it's going to be crucial for my career going forward so um it, it's it's been really a blessing in disguise being able to join that because you know in in all the junior categories you don't get to learn fuel saving tire saving pit stop strategy um all, all that stuff you, you don't get that in the junior categories because it's all sprint racing right so um there's a lot of mental things and a lot of racecraft tools that i've been able to take out of the sports car and i will be able to utilize it going into indycar this year nice uh well that is any kind of experience within those things just gets you uh kind of a head start on things like you said the junior category and i think that's kind of where we'll go uh, next on to it. obviously you are the first driver to win all the kind of steps of the road to indy ladder it's kind of been crazy you've done it in three consecutive years as well what has that journey been like for you from that kind of transition to karting to single seaters to then obviously working your way up the ladder to obviously now where you are with AJ Foyt. What, what was that junior um, category journey like for you? Uh, it was quick, um, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest, because, you know, I, I thought I was getting kind of a late start with everything. Coming out of karting when I was about 16 or 17, you see a lot of guys that are now 13, 14 getting into F4, and I think I won – yeah, four championship when I was 18 or 19, uh, it might've been 19. Yeah. When I won the F4 championship. So I was a little bit behind, but, um, you know, I had a lot of experience in cars prior to that. I did team inside scholarship. I ran F 1600. Um, I did F four for the season for a season. And then as soon as I got into the, the second, my second year in F four, I won that championship and they just kind of snowballed into all these other championships and scholarships where um ultimately i didn't have to bring a lot of funding to do so and and it's kind of forced me to be in this position where i need to win to move on and it really was kind of a fast track all the way to indycar from the point where i won the f4 championship and just moved straight through all the ladder systems consecutively every single year um but if i didn't win one of those championships and I finished second and I didn't get the scholarship, I might not be in this position. So um, even though it was fast, it was very necessary. I was going to ask that. I was, that was a question because obviously funding as an issue and it's an issue for a lot of drivers coming up because you know, you, you can have the talent there, but you know, my sports not cheap. <laughs> it's, no it is, it is an expensive sport to kind of progress through. Do you find that pressure of, knowing that if I want to go further with this, I've got to win this championship. Do you feel like that focused you even more so in the championships? And how did you handle the pressure of knowing I may not be able to achieve my dream of going all the way here if I don't deliver? Yeah, for some reason, like I, I've been asked that before and it really didn't put that much pressure on me. I'm not sure why it didn't, but looking back at it now, it probably should have. <laughs> knowing that knowing just, I just know during, dur, during the time I didn't I, I wasn't in the thought process of oh I need to win these these five championships to be able to make it to IndyCar that just wasn't a thought process for me um I was just like okay we need to win this race and then this race and then this race and then take it one race at a time and it all panned out so it, I didn't really have like a future it mindset like or a futuristic mindset i wasn't like okay i need to do this in x amount of years you know i was just focused on winning that race that i was at right then and there so um and i guess that took some pressure off of me just because i didn't think about what the future had in store um and it and it all worked out to be honest but for some reason now i didn't i didn't have that much pressure on me while i was in the lower categories when looking back now i probably should have <laughs> That probably is something that's helped you achieve it there by just simplifying it and taking it race by race and not putting that pressure on yourself. You're just like going, don't overcomplicate things. That was out of control. If you're good enough, it's going to look after itself, isn't it? And as a, yeah, yeah, as a yeah exactly. And, 
Exactly. And, um, you know, I was, I was with a lot of good teams, a lot of good personnel. Um, every time I went into a team and I had the confidence that the car that was under me was capable of winning. And when, when you have that kind of confidence, you know, you should be at the front. So it's not, it's not, there's no questions about, okay, what do I need to do with this car to be able to get to this place? You know, it's just like, okay, I've got the car. I just need to go drive to what I know I can do, what my, what my level of talent is and everything will pan out and we'll be able to win a bunch of races. So um, that definitely took a lot of pressure off me as well. Just knowing that I was with really good teams. Nice. So it sounds a very kind of level headed approach. Um, so obviously, yeah, you spoke about it going new teams. That was quite a unique aspect as well. Cause you were never with the same team with each ladder you kind of went up with. Obviously you linked with Andretti Autosport and that last Indy Lights mm-hmm. one. Um, but how, what was it like the transition between cars? What was like the step up in cars on each stage and also, uh, the step up in teams did just the whole, um, process just get a lot more professional bigger in terms of the staff on it or was it fairly similar up until maybe in the lights level i would say i would say it's all really similar up i mean i did run with cape motorsports between f4 and usf 2000 we won the championships back to back so there was a fam- mm-hmm. familiarity there um which was nice and then i went from cape to a team that was completely different it was a european team rp motorsports where they did everything in a very different way that I had to learn pretty quickly. Um, but me and the engineer got on very, very well. And we were ve- very much on, on the same mindset with everything. If he had something that he wanted to try, I never looked at him and said, no, that's not going to be a good option. You know? And we were in, if I recommended something, he'd be like, okay, yeah, let's try that. And it usually worked out. So, um, we had a great relationship and that that's kind of the main thing. It's not really how a team operates or whatnot. It's more, if the relationship and kind of how everyone's working together in unison is going well, then that's how you get results. Yeah, absolutely. That, especially for drivers and engineer, that's such a key relationship, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Isn't it? And I suppose, no, no doubt. yeah, I suppose yeah, no doubt. connecting. So you had pretty good relationships with each engineer as you went up and that, that obviously massively helped. Yeah. So, so going back through the years, like with Kate motorsports, they're run, by Dominic and Nicholas Cape, right? Dominic was the engineer. Nicholas would be the one setting up the cars and I had a great re- relationship with them. I mean, we won a ton of race- races, so you'd hope we did. And then, yeah. um, and then when, when I went to RP, um, Stefano Alessi, who had a very good pedigree between racing in over in Europe with F2 teams and F3 teams. And then he came over here to do the Indy Pro stuff. And um, I had a ton of confidence in him. And he had a ton of confidence in me knowing, knowing my background here in the U S and racing on similar tracks with similar cars. Um, and then when I went to Andretti, I mean, it's a no brainer. Some of the engineers there on the light stuff, they should be, they should be on Indy. Oh, well, one of them, Mark Bryant is Elio's, um, engineer and he did Devlin Di Francesco or he engineered Devlin Di Francesco and Elio last year for the, for the few races that he did. And, um, and then my engineer, Doug Zister, has been asked multiple times to go to IndyCar, but he loves the Indy light stuff and he loves watching kids grow up. So, um, the engineers with, with Andretti were absolutely exceptional. So there was never a doubt in my mind that, that they weren't doing anything right. So I had a ton of confidence with them. Um, and me and Doug, my engineer at Andretti hit it off really well. And, um, we developed a couple of really good cars for some good tra- or for some tracks that we uh, capitalize on, like, Road America and uh, Laguna Seca. We we learned a lot of stuff there, um, and but for the rest of the tracks, we pretty much just take the we took the same setup and were able to apply it from the previous years that Pat Pato Colton Oliver drove Rob McGinnis in the previous year, um, and we took those cars and were able to go win with those as well. So a bit, a bit of both uh, a bit of the best of both worlds between what. I was able to set up with the team, maybe on some of the stuff that, that they lacked and then taking all the stuff that, that we knew was really good from, from the past there and honing it all into one really good car. Yeah. I bet that wealth of experience that obviously they have in the category was like so key for you. And yeah, it was just more a fine tuning process of tweaking those little things to your driving style and what you want to get out of the race car compared to maybe a Pato or Colton, but you know, the groundwork that those guys laid to you was uh, yeah, pretty good foundation for the car to be on, wasn't it? 
Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So what was the main difference in the cars at each step up of level all the way to Indy Lights? Was it just more downforce mainly when you kind of get up each step of the ladder? Is it just kind of your speed through the cornering that kind of improves or uh, did they feel fairly similar throughout the whole road to Indy ladder? So the USF car and the Indy Pro 2000 car were pretty much identical. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just the Indy Pro has a little bit more power, a little bit more downforce and a little bit better tires. That's literally it. So after you do a few laps in the Indy Pro, it feels like the same car again until you get behind somebody and you have a big air (laughs) wash or something like that. But um, that one came pretty naturally. The lights car is quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. It's mostly because it's a bit longer wheelbase car. Mm-hmm. It's oh, it's also turbo, which didn't really affect me that much. I drove the F3 car was a turbo car, so I was pretty so pretty uh, familiar with that. And but the the biggest thing was the tire, the tire, the Cooper tire from Indy Pro 2000 to Indy Lights is a much stiffer tire going to the Indy Lights tire. So the spring rate and how it reacts and how much you can move the tire and how long it takes to come in was very unique to just that car, um, which. It really, in in my mind, it's not it's not anything like any other tire I've ever driven. But it's nice because it's it really taught me car control and mm-hmm. really taught me how to bring up tires really fast. I mean, you go out somewhere where it's really cold and you have, you're trying to get tire temp, and it takes five, six, seven laps to get any kind of tire temp in it. Um, I mean, that really teaches you car control with a car that's got 400, 450 horsepower. And you're just wheel spinning at third, fourth gear, you know? So, um, that, that was a nice aspect of that for at least my learning. Maybe it's not the most comfortable thing to be able to drive, but, um, that was the biggest difference between Indy Pro 2000 and Indy Lights was really just the tire. Oh, that's crazy in terms of, and tires is such a kind of unusual thing. Cause you just think, oh, just four sets of tires, you shove them on the car, don't you? And then, but it's such a key thing. And especially now, I think how they've developed, like you said, getting them into that right operating window. And that can be the difference between like having a good stint and a bad stint, can't it? Of how you kind of manage those first few laps. And obviously the in laps and out laps. Uh, Was that kind of a big kind of learning curve in terms of where you would position yourself uh, on your pit stops in terms of how, yeah, where where your preference, obviously it depends on what track, whether an out lap was better or an in lap. Uh, was are, are you car, saying for, for the sports car stuff? Because we're not doing pit stops in Indy Lights, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so for the sports I mean, in the car sports stuff. car and the sports car stuff. Um, you know, the, like Daytona, and it was it was. I think it dropped below thirty degrees at one point. We had like mm. a combined temp of ambient and surface temp of like seventy degrees, which is well below what Indy car will let us run. We have to have a combined temperature of of one hundred degrees of ambient and track temp. Okay. Um, so it was really cold at Daytona. So you'd go out and like, there's that really tight corner before you get out of the pits Yep. and you're on the pit speed limiter, right? Which is easy flat when it's warm, mm-hmm. but we were having to break for that corner and like just crawl around there. And the front is just so light. You just feel like you're driving on ice, uh, for the first few corners and then the heat comes. So having some of that experience in the lights car that, it's even though i mean the lights car doesn't have traction cold traction control doesn't have abs right mm-hmm. and then i go into the sports car that has both of those and which is a night nice, which is a nice help but some of the experience that i had from the lights car building up the tire temps really quick and trying to get some kind of pressure under me um helped at least for the for the out laps at daytona when i was getting in the sports car there nice it's nice that you kind of your experience in both categories have just kind of helped mold you to the driver and obviously make mm-hmm. everything you're looking at the driver is to make your life as easy as possible isn't it you know you're going to have so many challenges that you've got to compete against competitors and be them making your life a bit easier by understanding how to control those tires a little bit better and uh, the car in those difficult scenarios i imagine is uh yeah massive help yeah yeah no doubt all right so aj Foy was this signing um you were linked with andretti as soon as that kind of partnership uh with andretti wasn't able to formulate into a seat what was it about aj Foyt racing that you know made you go this is where i want to step into indica yeah so i mean it's a it's a bit of i wanted to be somewhere comfortable right Mm -hmm. in in indycar for for my first season i think that's something that's been super important for my career 
is every team I've gone into, I've been very comfortable with. I've known Larry, Larry Foyt since 2018. I met him for the first time at Road, Road America and he showed me around the car and was super open about everything. And I really like that about the team. And uh, we've spoken quite a bit ever since then. And um, there's some personnel and stuff on the team that I really like and that I've, and there's actually some people from Andretti that I knew that have, have made their way over to AJ Foy. So there's some similar, so there's some, some uh, similarities there and some familiarities really of um, team members and how they go about things and whatnot. So it seemed like the most comfortable atmosphere. Um, also I was able to do a full season with them. Right. So that was super, that was super crucial. I think for me getting a full season under my belt, starting my career in IndyCar is super important. Um, so that was part of it. And yeah, I mean, I've been just the way they're going about everything and the way that they want to kind of build this team and shape it into what I think it possibly can be in the next year or so, um, seems very promising the how much development that they're, they're putting into how much personnel they're getting on involved um they obviously have rocket back and back on board this year they're helping out um to some extent with some with some damper development from my understanding and from from their uh, from i think what they learned with the uh, f1 stuff or some people there mm -hmm. um and yeah so i mean i just really liked what they're trying to do and like I said, having a comfortable atmosphere where I can just focus on myself and build myself around the team and hopefully be, I mean, really in the past couple of years that I've been in the junior categories, I've kind of been the team leader, whether it was because I didn't have any team teammates or like any <laughs> lights this past year, um, I was kind of the team leader there. So I'm, I'm used to being in a position where we have to develop where I can't just be like, Oh, just give me his setup or his data and I'll try and learn. Right. I'm usually the one that's ha that has people learning off of me. So it's a comfortable situation to be in. A lot of people were like, Oh, well you shouldn't, you, it's, it sucks that you're kind of in this position as um, with no mentor or something to base off. I really don't think that that matters that much. Sebastian Bourdais has, has reached out to me and has been very willing to help out. Um, and coach me through some of the, the some of the dynamics of the team and some of the dynamics of how the race weekends go. Um, he's obviously really good at a place like St. Petersburg, so and he lives there, so he's he's offered to come out to that race and help us out as much as he can um, and kind of coach me through the whole process. So I mean, I still have some mentorship there with the team and whatnot, but um, it's a really comfortable atmosphere. So I'm I'm super happy I'm with them this year. That's awesome. Yeah. It feels like you've kind of fitted in seamlessly into it. And I was, Sebastian mm -hmm. Bourdais was going to be an interesting one because yeah, like you said, you've been the team leader yeah, through those junior categories. Um, and yeah, without an experienced driver alongside, but obviously Sebastian was in that 14 car last year and it showed that, you know, there were capable performances within their top 10 as well. When everything comes together on certain tracks, St. Petersburg, obviously, yeah, your home track, his home track in terms of it. Uh, do you feel confident in what you can achieve in that car, seeing what happened in it last year and obviously with the support system and taking on your confidence from your Indy Lights campaign or, again, no expectations, you're just going in to go, look, I'm trying to get the best out of this that I can this year? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of both. I don't. I really don't have that many expectations. I'm, I'm unsure of, of how the season's going to go. You always are when you go into yeah. a new season. Anything can change. Anything can happen. Um, but I mean, I've said this before, but it's just gotta, it's gotta, we gotta take it race by race, um, kind of just manage our expectations and, you know, it, and it's all going to come from within, right. It's going to be how we feel on a race weekend, how we think what we can achieve on a race weekend after we get through practice and qualifying. Um, and then if we do better than what we think we can achieve, obviously we'll be extremely happy, but no one can really see that from the outside. That's just going to come from within. Um, you know, I think, I think last year with Sebastian, he, he had a bit of an unlucky year. He had a few events where he's doing well and, and crashed out. You know, it's, it just seemed like it was nonstop him getting hit by other drivers and whatnot. And um, I think their performance didn't really show to what it could have been. So, um, and they, I think that they, they made it in the fast 12 last year at, at St. Petersburg. And, you know, the car is going to be good at, at a lot of places, I think. And as, as shown in the past couple of years, IndyCar 
between like first and 10th is sometimes maybe a 10th or two. Um, so it's just finding just that little bit or maybe just hitting a perfect lap can get you a back up front and be able to challenge for a win because qualifying means a lot in these, some of these events. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we'll have some really good performances, but I mean, we just have to manage what, what we think we can do per weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, it, it must be exciting to be starting the season off in that home race of St. Petersburg, mustn't it? You know, it almost, um, to achieve the dream of getting to IndyCar, to be starting in your home place, it, it's probably the best place for you to start, would you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like, if I, if I look back at Oliver Askey's first season coming out of lights, he went straight to Texas. Yeah. He went straight to Texas Motor Speedway, and that's a track I've got no, I'm not familiar with at all. Um, I've never driven, I've never driven a Indy car with, uh, speedway trim on it, nor have I driven on a speedway in any car or a super speedway. Um, so it's, that would be something that I wouldn't want to be going into. Right. You'd be like, yeah, oh, yeah. my first race racing against these, all these guys that have so much experience around a track that we're doing over 200 at. Um, so it's going to be nice going to a track that I've already had three seasons at. Um, I've had su- some success there. I'm very familiar with the track and, um, yeah, it's, it's my home track. I'm able to drive over there. I really love St. Pete and I'll have a lot of family and friends out there. So it'll be, it'll be a comfort, comfortable atmosphere for sure for my first ever event. Nice. And so obviously, yeah, you haven't tested, but what, what are you most looking forward to in terms of coming into this, uh, season before, obviously you've had the testing, uh, side of things. Um, are you feeling most confident on those kind of street and road courses? That's obviously what's predominantly you've driven on through the kind of junior categories. You get a bit of kind of oval practice, but, uh, or you really excited by the challenge of the ovals. And obviously I presume without, you know, stating the obvious competing in your first Indy 500 is going to be really exciting. Kind of one of the highlights of this season, I expect. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I mean, for me, I think, I think our performances, our best performances are going to be kind of on the street courses and some of the shorter road courses like mid Ohio or Laguna or something like that. I think that's where we're going to thrive. Um, and then ovals, I mean, I, I really don't have that much experience on it. So it's very, there's a lot of uncertainty there to what's going to happen. I think we're going testing there at some point um, at Texas. So I'll be able to get a little bit of time before we go racing there. But, um, for the most part, I don't have that much experience, especially going around for that long and having pit stops and whatnot and going to, going to Indianapolis where, like I've said before, there's guys that have 15, 20 years experience around there in multiple different cars. This will be, be my, going into the month of May, that'll be my first time ever driving around it. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but I mean, I'm really looking forward to, to the, shorter road courses and the street courses like St. Petersburg, Nashville, hopefully Toronto, um, and Long Beach, especially. Yeah. I think those are the kind of tracks where you can really probably make a statement on, isn't it? And, uh, probably where the team have achieved best in recent, especially with Sebastian, um, Bourdais over the past season, but yeah, that not having experience, does that make it almost scary? a little bit going into the season as part of you. It's such a different experience to all your other racing ones. And mm-hmm. to step up from an Indy lights car to an Indy car is quite a big jump. I imagine uh, going on the ovals. And like I said, it'd be the first time you'll be driving around at over 200 mile an hour. Uh, yeah. Right. How, how's that challenge in your head? How do you approach that challenge? You know, I mean, I would be maybe a little bit worried about it if, there weren't people a couple of years before me that, that have already done it and done really well. Like Colton heard uh, last year. I mean, what did he qualify second at Indianapolis and he's only been racing for a few years now in IndyCar and he did the same program as me moving up to the ladder system. So, I mean, I know I can do it. It's, it's not, it's not real. There's not a lot of really question. It's just the uncertainty of never doing it before, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorize it as me being scared of it. I think it's just, I know I'm going to have a lot on my plate and a lot to learn really quickly. Yeah, scared was probably the uh, wrong word. If you're a racing driver and you're scared, you're probably in the wrong industry. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Probably more excited <laughs> than anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no. So 
obviously you mentioned Carlton, you mentioned Pate, they were before you and Andresi Autosport. Uh, IndyCar's kind of lucky with this kind of new exciting generation. They've got mm-hmm. a few guys at the tail end of the careers, like the Dixons, the Powers, um, obviously Elio, Pagano's Q in the next few years you'd expect will uh, start to step aside within it. Are you really excited to be competing? Well, getting a chance to compete against those guys, but also being part of this next generation with Aussie Polo coming in and winning his championship in his second full-time season. Uh, the Coltons, like I said, qualified so well at Indy. Pato as well, doing so well with Aaron McLaren SP. And you've got Renus VK uh, showing what he can do at Ed Carpenter Racing. Uh, does it feel kind of, you know, really exciting to be leading the charge with this next generation and to go, you know what, I'm, I'm excited to be on track against those guys. I followed them behind them just a couple of steps in the junior categories. Now I'm excited to be on track there and going wheel to wheel with them. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, when, when we were, I actually raced against all of them. I raced against Renus, Pato, Colton, um, Oliver. It's a, I raced against all of them in the junior, uh, everyone except for Palau. I didn't race against him. Um, and as well, I think I raced against Callum Ila and Christian Lungard and Carding when I was younger. Um, and there was actually a point where I was a step ahead of them in karting, but I took a much longer route in karting and then got, got into open wheel a bit later and took a couple more years doing that. So, um, that's the reason why I kind of fell behind them. And now I'm just making this transition in, but, uh, it'll be nice being, being back together with those group of kids that I, that I grew up with karting against. And now we've all made it to. IndyCar. So it's a, it's a really nice feeling to, to be able to be back in that position with them. Um, and it's nice being part of, like you said, kind of this youth movement where there's a lot of younger guys that are succeeding and they're coming out in a similar position that I was. And it also gives me confidence, right? Knowing, Mm -hmm. Hey, these are all guys I've raced against. They've all done the same program. So it kind of solidifies that I'm in the right place. Um, it's not, there shouldn't be many questions of, Oh, do, do you think that he can do this? He's moving up. Uh, it's going to be his rookie year, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, well, all the other guys that have done it, they, they've done really well doing it. So I should be one of those. And that also gives me confidence too. Right. Um, mm. but yeah, I mean, there's like, there's definitely this youth movement. We're kind of taking over IndyCar, which is nice. And some of the older guys are probably getting upset about that, you know, cause we're, we're starting to give it to them now that we're getting a couple of years older. So it's a nice feeling to have, but I mean, still there's so much wealth of experience from some of the older guys like Elio and Dixon and Tony Conan has been in there forever um, that we can take from them and their experience shows on some of the races where maybe they're not as quick as us, but strategy wise, and they understand how to handle the car for an entire race. So we, we still have a lot to learn from them and a lot to learn for ourselves um but yeah it's it's nice being quick and, and giving it to some of the older guys that, that have been in it and, and i've watched since i was really young i was gonna say yeah it must be kind of crazy because like saying they, those guys like they castro Neves and dixon were kind of racing and winning uh races and indy 500s and championships when you were growing up and now you're like hang on a minute i'm on the same kind of grid yeah. as them and uh oh hopefully you're right now i'm wheel to wheel with them See you later, Scott Dixon. Uh, I'm passing you. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I think, the first ever IndyCar race I went to would have been, I think it was like 2006 or seven down in Homestead, Miami. And I think Dixon yeah. won. He was, dri- he was driving a Target car back then. So, I mean, I really looked up to him ever since a really young driver. And um, they obviously, there's a karting track literally just outside the speedway there. So I went from a karting track, went to my first ever IndyCar race that night. Uh, which was super incredible for me. And I remember watching all these guys and it's, it's pretty surreal to be sitting on the same grid as all of them. Um, I mean, what, 10, almost 15 years later. That's crazy. Absolutely Mm -hmm. crazy, isn't it? But I I suppose it also goes the longevity of going, you know, if you get this right and you kind of go there is, is this home for you that, you know, it's, it's really exciting that you can be going around all these great tracks and competing over a long time. Hopefully that's, that's the goal of it. It shows, what you can do within the series, but, um, racing hero, I've seen it's Rubens Barrichello. That interests me because I, I wouldn't naturally have, uh, pulled him out as the first name to mind. What, what was it about Rubens Barrichello that, um, was inspiring to you growing up? So, I mean, Rubens, he ran on a karting team with mm-hmm. me, uh, and his two sons, Dudu and Fefo Barrichello. Uh, they ran with this team called Ocala Grand Prix, and we did a lot of big national and international events together. And 
um, he, he kind of mentored me when I was younger and, and taught me a lot of things kind of just about how I kind of just like my personality around race teams and how to be and how to kind of build everyone around you and not really show that much emotion. Um, Mm -hmm. that's been a crucial thing that I've taken. So, I mean, he's a hero in a sense that he kind of really helped me out in my career. That's very interesting in terms of just by chance, obviously that you grew up at the same time as his kids and almost Mm -hmm. took you under his wing a little bit as you kind of, uh, were growing up. So is there another racing hero, a type of guy that as a kid, you're like, I want to be that guy or you're going, that guy's just awesome. I love watching him race. I mean, there, there's a lot of those, right? I mean, like (laughs) I used I remember watching Schumacher when I was young, watching, uh, watching Lewis Hamilton when I was young. I mean, there's all, all the F1 stuff, right? When, yeah. when you're growing up in karting, especially 15 years ago, um, growing up in karting, it's like you always watched F1 on Sunday. It's like religiously always watch that. Make sure you, you follow along there. Um, but now that I've been racing for so long here in the U.S. and IndyCar has taken off, um, kind of my mentality switched when maybe I was 13 or 14 years old and be like, you know, no, I want to go IndyCar racing. And, um, from the IndyCar side, I mean, I really looked up to Dixon and, and Dan, Dan Weldon. Those were the two guys that I was like, that's who I want to emulate. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, obviously rest in peace, Dan Weldon. What a great guy he was, Mm -hmm. uh, doing it. He was definitely a guy who wore his heart on his sleeve out on track. No doubt. Um, very inspirational to a lot. So another one was an interesting one. Um, you, you have a weird thing about shoes racetrack. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I guess that's, that's a weird one, isn't it? But, uh, I had a situation. I'm not super, I guess maybe I am superstitious, but I feel like I'm not superstitious. I'll say I'm not. Um, but there is a point in time when I was in F4 and I don't, I don't know why, but I thought Nike was just bad luck for, for whatever reason. Um, because I wore, I, always wore adidas to the track and i was I, I like to do everything kind of in repetitive motion right so like if i do bad one day because of something i like try and pinpoint what i did differently that day mm. that might have changed kind of my the way i went about things um so there's one day i bought these new pair of shoes and they're nikes and i wore them to the track and i probably had like the worst day of my life at, at a racetrack where i started i started pull i was leading the race, threw it off all by myself. It was just ridiculous. And, and I finished like 10th or something. It, it was, it was heartbreaking for me in that four. And then the next, and the next day I was like, you know, I'm going to put my D the only thing I did differently today is I wore these Nike shoes. So I put my Adidas back on one the next day. And I was like, oh, you know what? No, I'm crazy. I'm superstitious. And I went and did it again at another, at another race. And pretty much the exact same thing happened because I wanted to wear these shoes, but I was like, man, there's something bad luck about these. So I just, I, it, it's, it's probably nothing, but in my eyes, I'm just like, you know what? I'm never wearing Nikes again to the racetrack. That's just not a thing for me. That's crazy. Whether it's something it? or not, I'm just not risking it. <laughs> but you, you got to play safe with these. So, you know, that, <laughs> so that sponsorship from Nike comes along. You're like going, that guys, I really wish I could, but you're really going to stuff me if I do that. It's going to go bad. Exactly. Yeah. Us. You're like, yeah, I'm not going to perform very well if, if I'm under your guys' wing, unfortunately. Uh, but if you guys got a contact at Adidas, I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. All righty. Okay. So we'll, we'll round off um, just doing some kind of quick fire questions uh, or just kind of more shorter answers for it. Um, so is there any experienced drivers? Obviously you've talked about Rubens Barrichello there, but anyone else mm. um, who has kind of helped you along your journey or helps you that you can turn to in your first IndyCar season? Is there kind of an experienced head? So I mean, there, there? yeah, Sebastian Bourdais is one of them. That's going to be probably someone I, re- I really, um, that will be my first call this, mm-hmm. this season, knowing that he's been with the team. He's been in IndyCar for so long. He's won at places like, like St. Petersburg. So he's someone I'm going to bounce a lot of things off of this year. Mm. Um, but I mean, in the past, in the past, I mean, it's really been, it was Rubens and, um, Scott speed. If you, if you remember okay. Scott speed, yeah, he grew, yeah, yeah. He grew up for Toro Rosso back in the day. And, and, um, he was he, part of the his American dad, Red Bull program, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah he, was, he won a right. competition or something out. Yeah, exactly. Then he ended up going to F one. I think he went drove for a year or two in Formula One back in like oh four, oh five, oh six, something like that. Um, but I mean, that was kind of before my time. But he's his dad 
actually used to build all my karting motors because mm-hmm. he, it, they were like a big karting family, right? Like he wasn't yeah, yeah, going to yeah. go anywhere until he got the, the Red Bull scholarship program and moved over to Europe. But so his, his dad used to build my motors with the team Ocala Grand Prix um, mm-hmm. that Rubens ran on. And then Alex, who's Scott's brother, was all of our driver coaches and was my mechanic for some of my races. So um, I was very close to their family. He definitely was part of the reason that or that family is part of the reason that where I'm at right now, because they were kind of there for me when I was in the lower level of karting. I kind of won all these championships with them and moved into cars from there on out. So, um, that, that was another, I guess, bigger name you could say, but it was less Scott speed. It was more his dad and his brother, Mike and Alex speed. Nice. I, you just, I think as always someone, you, you kind of need that little help when you're younger and to go just that little push in the right direction. And obviously, yeah, having, uh, that experience within the karting ground, I bet was massive for you to kind of help along that journey of yours. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, what is your favorite track, uh, you've driven on today? So it, it's probably a bit biased, right? Because yep. I thought it, it would it's, be, but <laughs> it, it, it's always was... biased when, when you're, when you're thinking about, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say this, I'll, I'll switch it up a little bit. Probably one of the most fun races I've ever had was at Brands Hatch on, I think it's the Indy circuit. Do they call it? The shorter circuit yeah, yeah, there yeah. with uh, when I drove there in the Palmia Ford Festival. That probably was the most fun race I've ever done. And it just promotes a lot of passing in those little cars and you're able to throw it in. It reminded me a lot of karting, but a uh, track I always love going to, it kind of feels like home for me, is uh, it's been Ohio because I've just had so much, so much success there. And it's mm. the track that I had the most experience at too. I've driven literally every category there and I've, I think, won in every category that I've driven there. So, um, so yeah, I mean that's that's a bit of a biased opinion though. <laughs> well, you know, it, it it makes sense if you've won there a lot. Of course, it's going to be one of your favorites. Right, right. Uh, that's that's quite funny. Brands Hatch coming up because that's my uh, local track. Let's uh, go from there. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Um. So, what track would you love to drive on? It can be part of IndyCar or it can be any track, kind of worldwide. Huh. I would probably say. Maybe like uh, Fuji International. Yeah, you know, I actually did. I helped out uh, Toyota a little bit with it with their simulator stuff because um, they're from there, right? Mm-hmm. So I was helping them out there. I'm like, man, this is an awesome track to drive. I was like, imagine driving like a high downforce open wheel car around here. That'd be epic. Mm-hmm. Um, just the characteristics of like turn one. I just feel it's such a long straight, and you go into this really tight hairpin. Um, I feel like that would just promote so much good passing and then the high speed sections in the back is awesome. So, um, that's one place I really want to go to now that I've, that I've done some simulator experience around there, I guess. That'd be pretty cool. That, that is a very cool track and a bit left field, uh, from it. I, I think, yeah, it's F1 days where there was a bit of, I think track management was the reason they upset their relationship, which is why it's not on the F1 calendar anymore. But yeah, I think it was a great track for open wheelers. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Okay. So obviously most drivers, uh, get a car that goes along with the engine manufacturer for the team. So have you got your Chevy yet? Or if not, what car do you drive? So no, I've not gotten my Chevy yet, but that's not, uh, I, I actually told Sebastian Bourdais a few days ago cause he's building a new house. So he's actually got, he's got a truck, right? Yeah. And I told him, I was like, I was like, well, if, if there's a truck here in Florida, like I'll just drive that one. That that's, that's fine with me. Um, I don't need anything special. I just need something to get from point A to point B. And it, a truck would actually work for me because I do a lot of surfing and fishing and diving. So it's easy to just throw everything in the back there without ruining the car. Um, but Sebastian's like, man, I'm building a new house. I need, I need a truck to drive everything around and I don't have a truck. He actually sold his truck to, to a guy, Chris Wheeler, who, uh, owns like a, motorsports uh, consulting agency in, in Indianapolis. And, um, I was like, you know, I, you, you need the, you need the truck you're helping out this year. So hang on to it as long as you need it until you get your house built. And then, I, and then I'll take it from you when, whenever you're ready. Um, uh, but right now I'm actually driving a Lexus LX 570 that Lexus gives me, which is a really nice big vehicle. And, um, uh, I can also throw all my fishing and diving and, and surfing gear in there too and go travel around. Oh, that's pretty easy then. 
Easy, easy yeah. life. You've still got you. You got a choice of sponsors. Which one you have? You're like, Smith, <laughs> hold on to it. I'm okay. I'm cool. I'm sorted. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Okay. So obviously we've won a lot during our junior categories. What is your go-to victory meal? So like Colton's got his tacos. Uh, Pelo's got his fried chicken. Have you got any particular meal, or would you like to vary it up? I don't. I don't, to be honest. Um, yeah, there's not really a meal that that I say. I was like, oh, we, well, we went and did this after a race. Now, Colton's always had the taco thing. They used to have like a taco Tuesday at the at Andretti that everyone, if you won a race, uh, everyone would get tacos. It's probably still the same. If you won a race, everyone would get tacos that next Tuesday at the shop. Um, and I imagine it's still the same. So, yeah, I don't really have one, but I tell you what, about the past couple of years that we finished up from Daytona, like we go those two weeks where we just eat so healthily and make sure we're just like during the race, you just want to snack like, right. Like mm, you can't really eat a yeah. big meal or else you just won't feel good when you get back in in four hours. So you don't really eat a lot during the 24. So the past couple of years we're j- we just go all in after, after <laughs> the race and we go straight to five minutes after the race and get a big <laughs> burger and some fries and a milkshake. So that's what we've done the past couple of years. I don't know if that's what we would do after we won, but after we went out in 2021 and then this year we finished fourth, which is a very respectable finish uh, on the lead lap, only I think about 20 or 25 seconds behind. Um, we still went there. So that's kind of, I guess that will be a ritual for years to come. If I continue at the 24. Nice. So if people want to see you after the Rolex 24, they need to find you in the or local five guys in a food coma as you've just kind of, there's them one, you. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's right. It's literally right across the street from the raceway. So it's uh, it's pretty easy to get to. There you go. Everyone's going to look and find you there. Just collapsed in a chair. Just going, I need more fries. <laughs> oh, I think we may. <laughs> yeah. There we go. All right. Sorry. I think we lost connection there a bit, but we're all right. Okay, so I sorry, saw, yeah, I was glitching out there a little bit. Soccer, uh, football for me, but soccer, we'll, we'll go on the American. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a team that you support? I don't. No, you, you know, just like playing I mean, it yourself. You just... See, I played when I was younger, right? So okay, yeah. my, my father was, uh, he played an MLS, I believe. I'm not, I'm not sure for which team. I've been asked that a few times now, and I keep forgetting to ask him. And then my brother was also played in college and he played for some travel leagues here uh, in Florida and was exceptional. He's a striker. Um, and when I was, I played when I was younger until I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And I kind of mm-hmm. had to make a decision. Do I want to go karting or do I want to, do I want to keep playing soccer, football, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I picked karting. So, I mean, most of my family background is it comes from soccer. So. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, I suppose your decision to go in karting hasn't uh, has worked out pretty well. I think it's yeah. fair to say. <laughs> I mean, who, who would have knows where I would, would have went to if I kept playing soccer? Then you never know. Could who be knows? playing for Chelsea or Man United, Man City, right? <laughs> Could be. Your wages would be a lot bigger. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> your your mum and dad's like, hey, Carl, we would have been financially better off. Carl, you made the wrong choice. I just love racing. Yeah, exactly. Nice, right. Okay, I, I think this is probably a good point because our internet is, we'll either there. it's me or yours, is kind of going, uh, I'm giving up on this. So uh, how we round things off, Carl, is we get each driver to kind of do our kind of catchphrase at the end of it, um, which is, as I go, and for now, you indie fans, and then you have to come in and say, keep racing, and then we finish off with it there. Are you uh, happy to join in on that? I think for that, so what, what was the first bit again? There we go, yeah. I, I, I have no idea where it's kind of jumped out on. Right, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so you've got to say, when I go, for now, you indie fans, you've got to finish off with going, keep racing, and you've got to elongate that keep. And then there we sit. I can do that. Yeah, that you can do it, you're <laughs> in. It's, you know, it's a challenge between all the drivers. Most enthusiastic win. Simon was very enthusiastic. He, he took it very seriously. I think he's trying to go for an Oscar or something. <laughs> uh, we'll go from there. But no, um, but Carl, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure today. Uh, thanks for joining. Hopefully everyone's enjoyed this kind of chat at home. Um, but for now, you indie fans, 
Keep, Keep bracing. bracing. <laughs>